Thank you so much for being with us, Professor Zanka. It's a pleasure to have you here at The Voice of America. I'm sure a lot of our viewers uh, may wonder about why an American scholar would take such a deep interest in the lives of Uzbek farmers. What took you to Uzbekistan to do this research? Yeah, a lot of people ask me that. Of course, it's a very good question. I did write a little bit in the book about how I got interested in Uzbekistan as a teenager. And I wasn't interested precisely in Uzbekistan when I was in high school, but I was very interested in Russia and the Soviet Union, just in a general way. And I read a lot of Russian literature. And then I grew up in Queens, New York, and we had a lot of immigrants, Bukharan Jews, who were coming from uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. And I found those people just to me very fascinating because first of all, I couldn't really communicate with them, but they didn't look typically like Russian immigrants to me. And I was trying to figure out who they were. They told me they were Jews, and I said, oh, but you're from Uzbekistan, so you must be Uzbeks. And they said, yeah, well, we're from Uzbekistan, but we're not Uzbeks, we're Jews. And so that was, began a whole process for me of learning about what Uzbekistan was, who lived there, who were the different ethnic groups. And as I got into college, university, um, I started to learn a little bit more about it. And I also found out that in the United States, even people who studied the Soviet Union as scholars didn't know a great deal about Central Asia. So although it was still the Cold War, talking mid-1980s, um, I said to myself, I think that would be a place in the Soviet Union where I'd really love to go someday and do ethnographic or anthropological field research. And so basically from the mid-80s on, I guess you could say it was kind of a goal of mine to get to Uzbekistan to work there. And you went in and you wanted to live in an Uzbek village. You wanted to experience the real life or, you know, witness and monitor the lives of the cotton farmers specifically. Why cotton? Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. I don't know that cotton was really, you know, getting me all en enthused or enthusiastic, but I certainly knew that I did want to work in the Uzbek countryside because I had kind of an assumption that, well, I'm sure the Uzbek cities must be very interesting places, but maybe they're very Soviet, in, like a lot of other Soviet cities. And even though many different ethnic groups live there, there's something very sort of uniform about them. So I was determined that I wanted to get to the countryside because in my mind I wanted to see some aspects of Uzbek culture that, you know, may have very deep-rooted traditions and that people had been continuing with that way of life for a long, long time. So that was kind of an assumption I had. And so, of course, I learned about cotton and I learned that that was like the number one uh, agricultural product of Uzbekistan. So then it became obvious that if I was going to go to the countryside, it would be to study people living on cotton collectives. Yeah, that's right. And if you were to describe an Uzbek farmer to a non-Uzbek audience, um, you teach anthropology here. Well, I talk about people who honestly don't have a great deal of control over, I'm not going to say their lives, they do have control over their lives, obviously, uh, to, as much as anybody else does, but they don't have a lot of control over what they grow and what they produce. And they're as skillful as any other farmer in terms of growing things and knowing what's needed to make a, a healthy crop and all that. But I tell them that they don't really own their land, they don't really own their uh, products, they don't get the input that um, they decide on. So I, I, you know, and then that's of course gives me a chance to talk about the history of the Soviet system, pre-Soviet period, and what's happened since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So peasant people, farming people all over the world, I mean there are a lot of similarities among them, but I guess the case with Uzbek farmers is that uh, they're kind of restricted in the kinds of activities that make you a farmer. and that, That's kind of what I stress. The assumption here in the West is that farmers in Uzbekistan, uh, farmers in Uzbekistan are forced to cultivate cotton, that you know, they don't have the freedom to choose. Um, is that true, based on your research? I mean, the way I answer that is sort of yes and no. Um, co cotton is a way of life for people, so rather than outsiders thinking like every Uzbek goes into the cotton fields hating it and despising it, that's just not true. A lot of people, since they know cotton and cotton is such a part of their daily lives in terms of the, all the products they use, and as I always stress, the fact that people use cottonseed oil in their cooking, you can criticize that if you want to, or for better or for worse, but people love it and they're used to it. And so it's true that they've been kind of straight jacketed into farming cotton, 
But on the other hand, I wouldn't say that everybody looks on it as drudgery. A lot of people look at it as a means to make a living, and a lot of people think they could probably be doing better with what they grow if they had more say over their work, more say over their uh, the kind of cotton that, that they could grow, how much they should grow. So it's a little bit of both. Well, I mean, in your book, you do explore the depth of this Uzbek cotton culture. It, it's a generational thing for them. You know, right. their grandfathers were Pakhtakor, and sure. they, you know, their fathers were proud Pakhtakors yeah. too, and now they're doing this. If they had the freedom to choose what to, in many parts of Uzbekistan, farmers, they would still continue producing cotton. That's one of the conclusions. You yeah, were making, I mean, right? I think there's no doubt about that because um, as I've been doing over the years, talking about, well, why don't they grow more grain? Why don't they grow more fruits and vegetables? Everybody knows Uzbekistan produces all these amazing, wonderful fruits and vegetables. And there's definitely a market for those things. It's definitely profitable to grow those things. But cotton is an international export commodity that people in many countries want to grow because they know they can make pretty good money. And there's an insatiable demand, appetite for cotton. So I think that if a lot of Uzbek farmers kind of had their, their own way to decide, you know, made, the, made up their own minds about it, they'd probably diversify their crops. Maybe they'd say, oh, 70% is going to be cotton, 30% is going to be fruits and vegetables or a mixture of some other uh, crops. But I do think that if people had their, their choice, since they know cotton so well, I think they would just want to be more efficient with it and probably try to get the best possible uh, sort of cotton grown on their land. What are some of the basic realities that Uzbek farmers face that really make their lives miserable? Well, um, it's it, fundamentally it's the fact that they don't make a lot of money, you know, either working in the fields or having some job processing cotton, um, spraying pesticides, and that makes their lives really difficult that they simply don't make money with the cotton economy. Second of all, there's the question of water, which is you know, absolutely indispensable to the growth of cotton, a very thirsty crop. Um, securing access to good quality water is not easy, depending on where you are in Uzbekistan. So that's another huge problem. Um, the fact that people don't feel a lot of freedom to simply say, well, I, I would do cotton this year, but I'm not going to. I think I'm going to go and try this, or I'm going to go and try that. And believe me, people do that anyway, but they're not really, by law, they're not supposed to be doing that. So they take a lot of risks. Um, those are some of the factors, I think, that make it just really difficult to make a, a, a decent living being, uh, you know, a peasant, a peasant farmer, call it what you will. And a lot of people in the collective farms always stress to me, they'd say, we're not farmers. We understand what farming is like in your country, for example, but we, we're not those kind of independent people. We don't have those rights and freedoms. So they, they, they were very much aware of that. Many farmers we talk to tell us that if only they could own the land, things would be much better. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you do hear that all the time. That's right. Um, some of the farmers are also aware, depending on where they live in Uzbekistan, of just how difficult the conditions are, though, for like dividing up and selling parcels of land because you have a lot of people living in relatively small territories. And then it's complicated to think about, well, who's going to own, you know, 10 acres? Who might own 20 acres or hectares, whatever the case may be? Um, how's that going to affect all these families who are living in this area right now? Would they end up working for that guy who was able to afford 10 hectares? So these are questions that are really complicated, and I'm sure there are a lot of people in Uzbekistan who've examined them backwards and forwards. Um, but, but a lot of people realize that that's a difficulty. It's a, it's a conundrum to try to figure that out. Did you also study this complex oversight over agriculture in Uzbekistan, the way government views cotton, cotton production? Oh, yeah. And the political attitude toward farmers in general? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've always felt that uh, there's not a very healthy relationship between people who hold power and people who have no power. And I've always felt in my uh, living and witnessing those kinds of interactions in Uzbekistan that um, peasant farmers are not really treated with a lot of respect and their decisions don't really seem to count. And I think if that culture could slowly begin to change or that behavior, attitude, 
I think it would be a big improvement uh, for, for f agricultural life in general in a country like Uzbekistan. Based on your research, one can assume that the farmers in Uzbekistan, they are definitely not the middle class. And I mean, sure, there are some successful farmers. There's no question about that. And some people are very cynical about that. And they say, oh, yeah, well, that guy's successful because, you know, he's connected to this political guy or that's his cousin or something along those lines. And I don't doubt that that's true. But I also think that there are, you know, there are pockets, depending on what region of Uzbekistan you live in, where people who work very hard and are very innovative, they, they, they do make some money. But I don't think that characterizes, it certainly doesn't characterize the majority of the people involved in cotton production, cotton farming. So that, that's a huge problem. I would not call them a middle class at all. President Islam Karimov makes um, annual trips you know, around the country, goes and uh, meets uh, farmers. And uh, of course, you know, none of the farmers complain about anything. They're very happy. They are very thankful uh, for the policies that are in place. At least when we when we see them, when we watch them on TV, meeting the president. Um, but when you talk to them privately, they have huge grievances about the realities, about the policies in place, and how difficult, you know, it has become to farm. How difficult it has become to be a subcontractor to an agrarian firm. Um, that those are the things that replaced collective farms, you know, in many That's places. Right. Who is the one who signs this long-term lease with the government? Right. Who has the ultimate say, and who comes to you to ask for the profit? whatever m money you make off the harvest. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the agricultural structure seems to be so complex. Can you shed any light on it? I wish I could, <laughs> no. Um, it is just what you, dis it's just as you described it. And I think for a lot of us, especially as foreign scholars and foreign researchers, walking into this world and trying to get a grip on it and asking questions that we know make people in authority really uncomfortable and then, you know, occasionally being handed a piece of paper saying, well, here's the law. The law says, you know, you can own land. The law says you can go to a bank and get a loan. Um, the law says you have to bring your cotton to such a, this gin. That ne never begins to give you a sense of all of the machinations and all of the secret work that goes on behind the scenes about who actually controls the production and who controls... Um, the money that comes in from cotton and what happens in the books like you know when it's added like okay well we we uh, have delivered this much cotton and therefore we're gonna get this much money but then you have you, to share it with so many other people right and that figure may never be correct because if it's a lot of cotton for example then the people of a farm or the political leaders of a district know that they can get a lot of money for that and if they let the rest of the population know just how much cotton was produced for example then is an obligation to, especially if it's a surplus over the what was planned, then they're supposed to be sharing that uh, wealth, you know, sort of even by law, and it doesn't happen that way. So I was always asking people like, well, I thought it was a good harvest this year. Why aren't why aren't you guys getting more grain or more oil or more infrastructure? Like, why aren't the the, the canal system being fixed with this money? And people, they know that it's corrupt. They know that. You know, they'll, they'll tell me about the corruption, but they just don't, they don't seem to say like, well, we can get, you know, we can work our way out of this, or we're going to go to that collective farm chairman and let him know that he's a bad guy and he's done the wrong thing. You don't get any of that because people are really frightened. Um, there's no, there's no other way of, of saying it. And uh, you mentioned, you know, like the president comes around and, he, and everybody smiles and there's pictures and then he'll... Um, kind of celebrate the great pickings of a particular woman who picked 200 kilograms of cotton a day, you know, this sort of thing. But that was also true of the Soviet period. You, you always had those uh, public officials going around and, you know, saying like, we're one with the people. And it's a kind of continuation of that old Soviet style. And of course, when uh, an autocrat comes around to visit these villages, people are very, very frightened because they've been told you better be out there, you better be waving, you better look happy, and you better wear your best clothes. And he's going to come here and he's going to talk about the harvest. Don't ask him any questions, you know. 
let him ask you a question and you make sure you say something nice in response. You know, so it's, it's a show. It's an absolute show. In your book, you also talk about the lack of um, political knowledge within farmers, you know, the, the inability to express themselves and uh, promote their own interests. Um, yeah. There are a lot of farmers associations in the country, but do they represent what the farmers want in the country? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Uh, I think that really knowing, you know, what the farmers want, in order to determine that, you need a system whereby people who are politically engaged, who maybe are organized, have the freedom to go around and talk to different farmers and different collective farms. You know, that kind of freedom to say, hey, look, I think, you know, we should be doing this, and I don't like what the government is doing right now. But those kinds of freedoms for activist kind of people or engaged political people, they really don't exist in Uzbekistan. So therefore it makes it hard to say categorically what the Uzbek peasant farmers want, you know, to a person. You need like kind of constant polling too, in a way. Um, and I don't really think there's a good bellwether for what that is. I know like in my research, basically what I end up with, even if I've interviewed 50 people or 70 people or 100 people, it really does boil down to sort of more anecdotal evidence than hardcore scientific, you know, this is what the polling has revealed. We do have public opinion polls in Uzbekistan to a degree. There are some independent guys who work. Um, I think it's not impossible to determine right now where most people's hearts are with regard to the kind of economy they'd like to be participating in, and I don't think it's very supportive of what the state does. I mean, that, that is clear. So I think a lot of people would like some sort of a mixture of the state playing a more beneficial role in their lives and also the ability to be independent, to be private, and to, you know, get a taste of capitalism, which I think a lot of people haven't really had much of a taste of. I mean, despite what the Uzbek government claims and this uh, huge pride about its, uh, you know, farmers and how the Uzbek nation should be grateful to its farmers for feeding the nation, it's one of the least reformed sectors in the country. Oh, yeah. Why do you think government does not find it necessary to invest? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those questions that you ask and you say, I just don't get it. You know, doesn't it seem as if it would be great for everybody? And First, to say the first thing, you know, to say how states often will do this. They'll say, oh, you better thank your, you know, peasants and farmers for giving you that bread on your table. And it's easy to do that because, you know, nobody's calling you to account for it. People in the cities are like, oh, yeah, that's great. There are farmers out there, you know, who produce food for us, and we don't really have a connection to them. Um, Uzbekistan is a very agricultural country. So on the one hand, to say something like that, it just sounds good and it feels good. Um, the reality, of course, of not treating farmers very well, of not giving them much freedom of independence, uh, is, of course, a kind of irony, right? Because, you know, here you are, the state saying how you elevate and revere these farmers, but on the other hand, you not only don't do anything for them, um, you kind of hurt them in a way. And you're asking why the state doesn't say, let's do something more for these guys. They'll feel more invested in the state. They'll produce more. They'll be basically happier people. Um, well... I, I Is wish. it the lack of political will? Yeah, I think it's the lack of political will. I think uh, the status quo delivers what it has delivered for a long time. And for people who are elites or people who are trying to become elites or kind of climb that ladder, um, a lot of people in Uzbekistan are saying to themselves sort of like, if I can't beat them, maybe I should join them. I mean, I th a certain class of people, a certain number of people will think that way. And even if they have influence from maybe having lived abroad, or knowing something about the outside world, that doesn't really translate into, oh, and I'm going to make that happen in this country. Smart people will often say to themselves, well, there's no way I'm going to change this system by myself. So what I should do is I should kind of get into that system. Maybe I'll reform it once I get in there. And that's the world over. People think that way. Uh, so I think Uzbekistan, the power structure being what it is, the kinds of behavior that have existed for a very long time, going back generations, um, there isn't much of a will, especially with the people who really hold power, there's not much of a will to say, oh, we should maybe think about doing things differently, especially vis-a-vis -vis agriculture. In terms of what the United States could do to help Uzbekistan in developing its agriculture, whenever we report about what kind of aid 
you know, America can provide or should provide or is providing um, to Uzbekistan, um, you know, we get some in interesting remarks and feedback from our audience. And some of them um, have been saying lately is that if America wants to connect with the ordinary people in Uzbekistan, they want to get to the heart of that society, maybe it should start helping, assisting farmers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you may know now, before that really since the early 1990s, there were absolutely those kinds of programs between the United States and Uzbekistan. Um, it, basically what we would call farmer to farmer programs. And I remember back in 94, 95, 96, you know, these del you'd hear about these little delegations of like farmers from Iowa, or farmers from Mississippi, or farmers from Texas, you know, meeting one another. I also met some Uzbek men who had been to the United States as agricultural specialists. And they talked about all the things they'd seen and how incredible X, Y, and Z was and how, you know, Uzbekistan was going to be on that path soon. And the results about 20 years later now are just that, that those things didn't materialize. I, I wish I had the answer. Um, I think all of those were good ideas. I still think they're good ideas. But at the end of the day, you have to have the political will to say, yes, let's innovate. Let's do this differently. Let's listen to this advice. Let's reject that advice. And, you know, it's the same thing with tractors and mechanization. There have been a certain, uh, certain number of imported tractors. Case, uh, Case Corporation, for example, operates in Uzbekistan. <clears throat> but still, you don't see large-scale changes in how that affects ordinary people. So, what would it take for the for the farmers of Uzbekistan to unite and speak from one voice and make, you know, concrete recommendations to the government? Well, I mean, I think obviously what it would take is they'd have to be able to form a political organization, and they'd have to have the freedom to do that. They'd have to have the freedom of assembly. Um, they'd have to be allowed to make criticisms and judgments about their lives that they wouldn't have to fear for their safety or their well-being by possibly being, you know, jailed and worse. And you can't have the, you, you can't have a party that's made by the government. And it's really got to be independent. So, um, and, and I think that it would be wonderful if the government wouldn't see those kinds of parties as threats but actually like, okay, well, we've been criticized now. What should we do? How should we respond? This, the Uzbek state, since it was formed in 1991, is not uh, an entity that enjoys being criticized and enjoys being told you're doing things incorrectly. Or could you, could you consider changing the following? They don't like to hear that. Children pick cotton, whether the government denies this or not. And, um, you know, some of them might be picking it because they want to, because they want to make money, but some of them are you know, also claim that they're right. picking them because right. they're being forced to. Yeah. And this has been such a critical question for the past few years yeah. because there's such campaign going on against it in the West. Um, what would it take for, the, for Uzbekistan to stop using children or any kind of forced labor to pick the harvest? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm not an expert on the, the child, children's issue per se, but um, what I think is that the children probably aren't contributing a whole lot, actually, to the harvest. I mean, I think they're contributing something. And I know I've heard these terrible stories of school teachers threatening to hurt the children, beat them, you know, give them a thrashing if they don't pick so many kilos and all that. I personally never experienced that. And I will say that I did see children out in the fields picking cotton. I have pictures of it in my book. And um, believe it or not, I was naive enough at the time that I was experiencing this that it really didn't register with me that this was a terrible thing to be doing to the kids, and I'll tell you why. The children were out of school for maybe a month, but I also, and I, I know that every region of the country is different, and every collective farm is a little bit different, so it's not all uniform, um, but the kids would come out for like half a day, and it, it, to my mind, it was somewhere between playtime and not really doing what you wanted to be doing, which is picking cotton. Um, but I didn't see it as the way it's presented sometimes, which is like, oh my God, you know, these children are, are, are facing the lash and they're, they're marched out to these fields and they're told. To... So I'm not trying to make light of it because I think it's a very serious issue and I certainly think the state should do a lot more to make sure it's not happening and they're not closing down schools. Um, I think what it would take ultimately to stop that is that you need enough hands to pick cotton, that's A. 
or you need enough mechanization to be harvesting the cotton so that you're not so people dependent. But I think since the mid-1990s, Uzbekistan uh, has gone in the direction of manual labor rather than mechanized labor. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. Some of them could be valid, but if the state is serious about delivering a better quality of life for, uh, for peasant farming people, having children picking your, part of your crop is, is not the way to go. That's, that's pretty, I think that's pretty obvious to anybody who's concerned about development in, in the world. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for having me now, Bohor. It's been a pleasure.